Hello, this is Ross Bliley from the podcast Pigskin Tales. This podcast is sponsored by Sterling Soap Company. With products sold throughout 41 locations around the globe, Sterling Soap Company has a unique assortment of products to choose from for your loved one for the holidays. Handmade artisan soaps created by Roderick and Amanda Lovin since 2012, these products are affordable and provide great value. Act now and save on your shipping costs. If you purchase $75 or more, your shipping cost is free in the United States. Shop now online at sterlingsoap.com. What's up, sports history fan? Dana Augusta here of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast. Ever wish you can get behind the scenes access to the Hockey Hall of Fame and dive into the untold stories that shaped the game? Then you need to check out Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories Part 2 by Eric Zwieg. Eric's latest book is packed with wild, unexpected tales from epic rivalries and game-changing moments to quirky incidents like polo injuries and snowblower mishaps. Eric Zwieg's impeccable research and passion for the sport of hockey will whisk you through the NHL's early years, the origins of the Three Stars tradition, and how hockey first hit the airways, plus you get fresh takes on legends like Wayne Gretzky, Bobby Hall, and Joe Sackick. Hockey Hall of Fame True Stories 2 is available now wherever you get your books. Grab your copy and get ready to dive deep into the heart of the game. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience. And today we bring you the story of Magic Johnson's greatest game of his NBA career. And I have to admit right up front that I am a Lakers fan. I grew up in Southern California, right in the middle of the Showtime days. My dad is a fan going all the way back to the 1960s when he first came to the United States from Peru. The same year that he arrived in the United States was the same year that Wilt Chamberlain joined the LA Lakers to play alongside Elgin Baylor and Jerry West. Including my kids, we are three generations of Lakers fans. And my favorite player of all time will always be Magic Johnson. So I am very excited to share with you Magic's greatest game. Now, let us keep in mind that Magic has played in some of the biggest games in NBA history. The man played in the NBA Finals a total of nine times, and he won five of them. Today's story is about one of those times that he won. In fact, it is about the first time that he won, during his rookie year in 1980. Magic was only 20 years old during his rookie year as he left Michigan State University after only two years of school. After all, he had just defeated Larry Bird and the Indiana State University Sycamores in the spring of 1979 for the college national championship. And in the process, he proved himself to be the best college player in the country other than Larry Bird, of course, who had been drafted the year before by the Celtics. So he was easily the number one pick in the 1979 NBA draft. The rumor is that the Lakers briefly considered taking Sidney Moncrief from the University of Arkansas. The main reason for this was that the Lakers already had Norm Nixon, an all-star point guard, which is the same position that Magic played. Normally, it does not make sense to draft a player when you already have an all-star at that same position. But another draft theory says that you just take the best player available and figure out the positions later. As a Lakers fan, I am thankful that the brand new owner at the time, Dr. Jerry Buss, and the rest of the team management had the same idea and took Magic Johnson with the very first pick in the entire draft. Magic Johnson joined a team that already had three All-Stars playing on it. I have already mentioned Norm Nixon at point guard, They also had Jamal Wilkes, who played mostly small forward, and in the middle, the great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the six-time league MVP who was still in his prime. Now, the Lakers did have a tough time figuring out how to play two all-star point guards on the same team. Now, yeah, Magic was the starting point guard for the Western Conference in the 1980 All-Star Game. It took him only about a week into his rookie year to establish himself 
as the best point guard in the league. In the history of the NBA, there have not been that many rookies who walk into the league as one of the top 10 players in the league on day one. Off the top of my head, I am thinking about Bill Russell, Bob Cousy, Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor, Oscar Robertson, Jerry West, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Larry Bird, Michael Jordan, Shaquille O'Neal, and Tim Duncan. Now, I apologize if I miss someone, but in terms of being top 10 in the league on day one, I think that's about it. The Lakers steamrolled most of the league that year. They had a date with Destiny as they lost only two playoff games on their way to the NBA Finals. Once in the Finals, they matched up with Dr. J and the Philadelphia 76ers. Now, this is no insult to Kareem. That same season, he also won his sixth league MVP award and deservingly so. He was still the most unstoppable scorer in the NBA with his patented sky hook, but everyone also knew that Magic was the engine that made Showtime run. And I literally mean run. With Magic on the team, the Lakers' fast break offense was incredible and so insanely difficult to stop. The Lakers were already a really good team, but with Magic at the point guard, that team was supercharged. The Lakers and 76ers split the first two games in Los Angeles, and then they went ahead and split games three and four in Philadelphia, and now it was back to LA for game five. The Lakers did win the game, but they lost their primary weapon in doing so. Kareem had an absolutely incredible game. He shot 67% from the field and poured in 40 points to support the Lakers' effort. However, late in the game, he scored on a sky hook and came down on the foot of Lionel Hollins of the 76ers and severely sprained his ankle. He did finish the game, but he was already being ruled out for Game 6 back in Philadelphia. And that was an enormous blow for the Lakers. After intense deliberation, the Lakers decided to go ahead and leave Kareem in LA to allow his ankle to heal. The Lakers' thinking process was basically to give away Game 6 in order to have Kareem as ready as possible for Game 7 in Los Angeles. They figured that the series was probably going to go to 7 games anyway, so might as well allow Kareem to rest, who was the main scorer, and have him as ready as possible for that Game 7. And this was a huge gamble to take. But Magic had a different idea. As the Lakers boarded the plane in Philadelphia, Magic went and sat in Kareem's seat on the plane in order to send a message to his teammates that they were in good hands with him. In fact, this 20-year-old rookie looked at the rest of his teammates and said, Do not fear, for 32 is here. And off they went to Philadelphia. Now, this is a good place to take a break, and I will be right back with Game 6 and the greatest game of Magic Johnson's career. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row 1 catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row 1 Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Hello, sports history fans. I'm Ross from the podcast Pigskin Tales. You're about to jump into another thrilling sports history moment. But first, let's dive into today's sponsor, just in time for the holiday season. Introducing Art of Words, the brainchild of word artist Dan Duffy from Philadelphia. Dan meticulously crafts stunning images by handwriting relevant words from some of the greatest sports moments in time. These unique budget-friendly illustrations are the perfect gift, sparking cherished memories and capturing hearts. 
Choose from city skylines, sports, history, and musicians to find a piece for everyone. And here's the exciting part. For that sports fanatic in your life, gift them a piece of their favorite team or player's history. Art of Words tells a compelling story. Explore collegiate stadiums, each meticulously crafted with every football victory etched into words. Or venture into baseball stadiums, handwritten with every player from the team's illustrious history. My favorite on the site is Bryce Harper 2021 MVP year. Because I'm a big stats guy, I think that's one of the coolest things ever. Check it out! Don't wait! Order a print today for yourself and your loved one this holiday season. Transform your wall into a gallery of captivating art and surprise your family and friends with a print of their own. Use code SHN15 at artofwords.com for a 15% discount on your order in November and December. Visit Art of Words, where words magically transform into stunning art evoking cherished memories and touching the hearts of those who you care about. Again, use the code SHN15 for 15% off at artofwords.com. Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the story of Magic Johnson's greatest game. As I mentioned before the break, the Lakers were leading the finals three games to two. They only needed one more game to clinch the championship, but they had to leave Kareem back in LA with an injured ankle and they were going to play game six in Philadelphia without the reigning league MVP and their best score. The night before the game, Coach Paul Westhead needed to figure out where they were going to get scoring from with Kareem unavailable. Well, for his entire life, Magic had always been the highest scorer on his team. Magic could score if he wanted to and score in bunches, but he had not yet had a chance to really show that part of his game when he was on the same team as Kareem, Nixon, and Wilkes. Magic understood the game so well that he knew that he did not need to score a ton to be effective with the Lakers. He was surrounded by scores. His best contribution to the team was to run the offense and create easy scoring opportunities for his teammates. In other words, his best asset was his ability to be a playmaker. So with that in mind, Westhead asked Magic to score at will, and Magic was ready. He even called his father to let him know that he was about to go on a scoring binge in game six and play the same style of game that he had played in college and in high school. The following night, Magic was introduced as the starting center in place of Kareem. Norm Nixon would play the traditional point guard role and Magic would play the traditional center role, at least for a few minutes. He even went to center court to jump center against Caldwell Jones. Now, if you watch the video of that game, the 76ers are genuinely confused that Magic was playing center. It created all kinds of matchup problems. Daryl Dawkins normally guarded Kareem, but he could not guard Magic because Magic was faster and could take him out to the perimeter. But the Lakers were fine going the other way. Magic was six foot nine and as big as most big men in the league back then. So it was no problem for Magic to guard Dawkins or Jones, but they could not guard him. Everything came together for Magic that night. He completely dominated the game. In addition to playing center, he also played forward and point guard when Nixon took a break. Magic played all but 30 seconds of the game. The game was as intense as any game I have ever watched. Magic had the game of his life. Literally, nobody on the 76ers could guard Magic when Magic went into scoring mode. The 76ers guards were too small for Magic because he could easily overpower them, and the big men were too slow to keep up with a quicker Magic Johnson. In the end, the Lakers won the game by a score of 123-107, to a 16-point victory. Now, Magic finished the game with 42 points to lead all scores. He also collected 15 rebounds, which was double his average because he played most of the game in the front court as a forward or center, as opposed to his regular position as a point guard in the back court. He also had 7 assists, 3 steals, and a blocked shot. I mean, the man was already the best point guard in the NBA, and it seemed that he might also be the best power forward in the league if that had been his primary position. What Magic did on that night was show the entire league that he could play all five positions at a high level. Nobody in their right mind would have ever asked Bob Cousy and Bill Russell to switch positions. Nobody would have ever asked Kareem or Shaq to play point guard. 
but as a natural point guard, Magic Johnson could play all of the other four positions and played them very well. But the Lakers' victory put the NBA voters in a tough position. When it comes time to award the finals MVP award, it goes to the player who had the best performance over the course of the entire series. In this case, that would have been Kareem. Even Magic says that would have been Kareem. But Kareem was back in LA nursing an injured ankle. It would not have looked good on television to give the finals MVP award to a player who was not even there. So they decided to give the finals MVP award to Magic Johnson, who was the star of game six. And did I mention that he was still just a 20 year old rookie? Rookies are not supposed to do these kinds of things. They are not supposed to be able to play all five positions at a high level. Rookies are not supposed to be starters at the All-Star game and win a finals MVP. Rookies are not supposed to carry their team to an NBA championship. And he certainly was not supposed to do it against a 76ers team that had six All-Star players. But here he was. Irvin Magic Johnson. Legally, he was not even supposed to drink the celebratory champagne after the game because he had yet to turn 21, which is the legal drinking age in the United States. And very simply, the game was one of the greatest games ever played by an individual player in NBA history. Not just because of the overall performance, but because of the context of the game being a championship closeout game. I put this right up there with Wilt's 100-point game or Kobe's 81-point game or Nate Thurman's quadruple double when he had 22 points, 14 rebounds, 13 assists, and 12 block shots. This one was definitely one for the ages. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for hanging out with us. Join us next time when we go all the way back to the 1930s and 1940s to take a look at the heyday of college doubleheaders at Madison Square Garden. These games help to broaden the appeal of college basketball. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcast. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, aka the football history dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and we're able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds, as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website, seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.